EU exit related issues and the oral evidence session this afternoon from Department of Justice officials. So we'll invite them to make their way into the room. Um, for your benefit, members, the papers are pages 85 to 310 of the meeting pack. There's a research paper that was requested by the committee and that was circulated to members on Tuesday afternoon. And it can also be found in the table pack at pages 57 through to 77. So as the witnesses take their place, let me... Um, we're going to have Linda Hamilton, Deputy Director, um, McGillan Implementation and EU Exit, and Graham Walker, Head of EU Exit Preparations from the Department of Justice. They're here at the meeting, and uh, if the technology permits, um, Bill, Billy Stevenson, who is the EU Exit Preparations, is going to attend by Starleaf, but as of now, is not dialed in for it. So uh, we're going to proceed. Anyway, so let me well, formally welcome Linda and Graham to the meeting, and um, it'll be recorded by Hansard, and then it's going to be published on the committee web page in due course. So, Linda, you're very welcome. I think I'm going to hand over to you um, to, to give us a, a briefing, and then we'll go to members' questions. Thank you, thank you, uh, Linda. Chair. I don't know if you can hear me, can you? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to brief the committee today on EU exit and impact on justice issues. Um, I'm joined today by Graham Walker, who is the head of the EU Exit Preparations team, and hopefully we'll get Billy uh, joining us virtually um, at some point. Uh, this briefing was originally planned to take place in April, and we provided a detailed paper on EU Exit matters for that meeting. Uh, we have provided the committee with an update to that to just supplement our original paper to recognise the EU-related issues that have taken place since that original paper was written and just to give more detail on our preparations going forward. The outcome of the current negotiations are, as you know, unknown at this point. The negotiations have moved into an intensive phase as both sides seek to reach an agreement before the end of the transition period, which is now less than six months away. There is no certainty yet around what that outcome might be at this point, but both sides uh, continue work to reach an agreement and a non-negotiated outcome remains a possibility. The key thing for us and our justice partners is how the outcome uh, of the trade negotiations and implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol will impact on justice. We are aware of broad risks in terms, for example, the impact on crime and organised crime, but until we see what is agreed at the negotiations and understand better how the protocol will be implemented, it is not possible to fully identify the operational impact and put any possible mitigations in place. Chair, having said that, I want to assure you and uh, committee members that we have been working with our law enforcement partners to develop contingency plans for the eventual outcome of negotiations based on a number of scenarios. This includes working with colleagues in other Northern Ireland departments, as many non-justice issues have a justice angle to them. We've also worked closely with the UK government, in particular Home Office, and uh, colleagues in the Irish government. We also can't ignore the potential impact of the COVID pandemic, especially as COVID recovery plans are likely to coincide with the end of the transition period, and we are including this in our planning. So if you're content, I'll end my opening remarks now. Uh, much of what I might say is contained within the two papers, and of course we're happy to take any questions that you, Chair, or committee members may have. Thank you. And I thank you, Linda, very much for that, and I'm sure members will, will pick up on the, the questions from the papers. Um, just I suppose some general questions in the first instance. Um, is the department satisfied that um, the UK government are taking on board the issues that are being raised from a Northern Ireland perspective as ultimately it's the UK government that are carrying out these negotiations with the European Union? So um, can you give any assurances to the committee in respect of that? Yeah. So while the, out while the outcome of the negotiations isn't known, we've done a lot of work um, at official level, particularly with officials in Home Office, uh, to put across Northern Ireland priorities. So the things that are particularly important to justice and security partners in Northern Ireland. So those were outlined in our correspondence, but it's things like understanding the unique position that Northern Ireland is in, having a border effectively with the EU. 
um, maintaining that operational uh, cooperation with uh, law enforcement partners in Ireland and the rest of uh, the UK, ensuring the safety of citizens and trying where possible to get as close to some of those EU tools and measures as possible. And thinking about crime types, so thinking about organised criminality, what that looks like here and what tools and measures may be needed here to factor that in. So I would say Home Office have been uh, very receptive to that and have understood the position that, that we have outlined. Ultimately, you know, the proof will be in whatever negotiated outcome or otherwise happens, but I am content that they have taken on board those issues and we have put them forward as, 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 as comprehensively as we can. And is that being all channeled through the executive subcommittee um, as a, the formal link between the executive and the UK government? So, um, so no, it hasn't. We've, we've done both. So we have actually uh, developed over a number of years of, of both of us working on Brexit, quite close relationships with officials in Home Office. So we have gone to, uh, the minister has gone to the executive with those those principles and those objectives, but we have shared those with Home Office. The Minister has shared those with the Home Secretary in the past. So I think that direct link um, with Home Office as they build their negotiating uh, strategy has been the sort of crucial part of that. Can I, could I just yes. add to that, Chair? Yes, um, as Linda says, the relationship with Home Office is, is particularly good. Go, going back some time, um, we had actually secured um, a seat at at the table, so to speak, for PSNI and PPS and so on, the Crown Solicitor's Office, in relation to you know bringing that operational knowledge and the operational requirements to to the discussions at a policy level with Home Office. Um, so we and, and and that has been you know the, the case going forward. So in terms of our, are we content that the specific Northern Ireland issues around some of the tools and measures have been heard and, and taken on board? I think the answer to that would be would be yes. So there was. As Linda said, obviously we have no direct involvement in the negotiations themselves, but certainly operational partners have been in, embedded in that thinking process from Home Office and, and wider UKG beginning to think about their negotiating positions. And what's the kind of indicative time frame for starting to see the colour of the money, so to speak, when it comes to, to a resolution? Well, Obviously, both sides have sat out in, in their approach to negotiations the, the way that, that, that they intend to, to approach a, a, a solution. Um, as you know, the fourth round of negotiations finished largely without a huge amount of, of uh, resolution on the, it was the 5th of June. They started again, began again on Monday. Um, I think there's another four or five possibly um, rounds of negotiation which will I think are due to end probably towards the end of August. I do have a, I do have a timetable somewhere. Um, I think the, the sixth round, um, the sixth round is to finish in Brussels, I think on the 21st of August. So it's hoped that that intensive period of negotiations, the tunnel negotiations almost, will mm. get some sort of re resolution on, on the detail. Um, and do we have any indication as the potential pieces of legislation or? Westminster's taking it through, if we have to do LCMs, for example, is there a piece of work highlighting the type of areas that we may need to be to dealing with? I th yes, the, there is. I mean, there's, there's a huge uh, package of legislation required across, across the piece. Justice is in a relatively fortunate position in that I think we only have identified or uh, four or five instruments which, which are likely to be needed to be taken forward to, to implement certain aspects. Um, the sense is that because those relate largely to accepted and reserved matters that they could be taken forward in Westminster, but I understand that the Executive Office is planning and issuing guidance to departments on the, legis the Northern Ireland legislation that will, will have an interface with Northern Ireland issues, and I think we'll probably be discussing with Assembly officials how that is taken forward, but hopefully I can reassure you by saying that after recess, there won't be a raft of legislation in the way that perhaps other departments will have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm um, happy to bring in members now at this stage. Thank you. Linda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to both of you for your presentations. Um, just in relation to policing and judicial cooperation, 
in December. Um, will if there's if there's no great deal, will they affect? Will that affect the ability or the willingness of the UK authorities to punish breaches of EU customs law here in the north? No. Th maybe to, to approach that in, in terms of sort of sort of a wider point, um, the if there is no overall outcome or no no overall agreement and the UK and Northern Ireland law enforcement have to fall back on older measures, non-EU EU measures, there, there will obviously be a capability loss um, across the piece in, in relation to criminal law, uh, because the, the measures that we might have to fall back on in, in those circumstances are much older and much cumbersome, much more cumbersome. So in terms of law enforcement capability generally, there, there, would, be a, there would be a gap there. Okay. Billy, can I just check? Sorry, for yes, yes, go Billy, ahead. I'm just checking you're on, on stream now. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm on sound. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, yeah, encourage, yeah. I'll encourage members to speak up for your benefit, but I just wanted to check. I can, I can hear well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Sorry, Linda. No problem. And then, just in relation to the the protocol mm. on the customs arrangements, am I right in saying that that is only as good as the enforcement of it in a no deal scenario? So um, I think I, th I think a culture of lawfulness, which is sort of how I've looked at it, a culture of lawfulness is is really important here. So any new arrangements, um, whether they're through customs or or, or, or checks or, or whatever those might look like, there needs to be awareness of them, and there needs to be you know people need to know how to comply with them in good time, um, you know, so. I think if that is your question, then yes, absolutely right. Um, any new arrangements need to come with relevant enforcement arrangements alongside them and IT and all of those different things. Sure, I'm happy enough to let others co come in and I can come back in okay. then. Yeah, no problem. Um, Mr. Woods. Thank you, and thank you very much for coming today. And, um, you had provided some briefings before this, but I think it's really useful for us to um, have this opportunity um, to do this before recess. Um, in terms of a number of questions that the Chair have already picked up on, um, but the event of a no deal, we'd come back after a number of years of um, having no assembly and there was a lot of um, bits of legislation that the committee has had to look at um, in February, which in my understanding and being a very, relatively new MLA, was to um, put in measures if there was a no deal. Does that still apply? And is that kind of the foundation of where we are at the moment before we have any new additional legislation or LCMs coming through in September? The, the legislation that... My understanding is that the, the, the legislation that is already in place in respect of no deal outcomes is still relevant uh, on a, to put a more positive slant on it um, in, a, in a negotiated outcome there will there will be another piece of legislation which um, I think has been referred to as the winding down provisions which will prepare the ground for going forward in a, in a negotiated outcome so there, there will be some traffic around around those issues um, but in a no deal scenario, as far as I'm aware, there would not be a need for additional legislation. Okay, well, just hoping that doesn't happen. Um, in terms of the, um, I don't know, it is in the department's correspondence about correspondence coming from the junior ministers. Um, I'd certainly be interested to know if you know when that's coming to the assembly, given recess is starting, I assume, next week. And has there been any correspondence given to the Assembly on Brexit issues? Is this wider Brexit issues? Sorry. Yeah, so it just had said about the common frameworks and uh, UK wide approaches, and that there was going to be correspondence from the junior ministers' lines, um, uh, when, and sort of that they were going to be tabled to the Assembly with details and potential legislation. Not sure about that. We can find out though. Okay. Just not being in the executive and not 
aware of, of that. Yeah. Um, just obviously mindful of the time. Um, and then in terms of EU exit related costs, um, I brought this up with the Permanent Secretary. Um, I had written to the Minister on this and that there would be, there had, my response was said that there was no plans to provide uh, a report to the Executive on EU exit costs and beyond resourcing for the PSNI, no further financial re um, requests as a result of EU exit. Is that still the case that there's no, is there no assessment being made of potential costs from January or there just isn't any costs for justice? I think that's a really good question and a timely one. Um, so last month, the executive kicked off readiness planning again. So as we face a non-negotiated <coughs> outcome, which is effectively no deal exit, this readiness work has to start again. Now, th there are costs for, for PSNI in particular around that loss of tools and measures, but there are also likely to be costs around the implementation of the protocol. But because the implementation of the protocol remains fairly unknown at the moment, exactly what that might look like, it's quite hard to quantify what those costs specifically may be. So there is an exercise um, that is ongoing. We actually have had a number of meetings with a, a selection of law enforcement partners over the last couple of weeks just to get that readiness work started again. Um, and part of that will be looking at the costs that they have. Now, I'm not aware, I mean, I, th I think we have sort of reminded all partners to think about what those costs might, might be. PSNIs are the most obvious, but there may be costs for other partners, so that exercise will be going on. So I think... I would be reluctant to say that there definitely wouldn't be any additional costs. I, I think, you know, inevitably there may well be. Yeah. And happy to keep the committee updated on that. Well, I certainly um, appreciate that. I, I'm finding it a bit difficult to think that there won't be costs for yeah. the department come January and moving yeah. forward. And obviously, um, when we're discussing budgets, how that's managed. Um, if we, it's obviously, I appreciate that it's a very um, fluid situation and there aren't any details as such of what what's going to happen. But in terms of just with the, in the within the justice family, I can see that there would be lots of changes, especially yeah. with regard to IT and perhaps setting up a new databases for data sharing. Or that I don't know how that would work, but um, that there would it would be unlikely in my head that there won't be additional mm -hmm. costs. And how we then, as a committee, are able to look at, at budgets mm -hmm. and allocate resources? Would there need to be a case then um, made? The department need to put in additional bids to finance for that. Is is that being looked at? You know that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and I think some of that as well is a question around what a uh, treasury. You know what costs the UK government may meet, and what costs the UK government are being asked to meet to meet around, in particular, the implementation of the protocol. And I think when you when you consider costs, it's important to think about costs for justice partners, not in relation to a very narrow justice and security sphere, but costs that may arise for justice and security partners as a result of developments in other policy areas. So, you know, that, that, that may touch on justice and security issues. So that sort of wraparound look um, at budgets, I think, is is really important and uh, and will be part of the sort of work being done over the next few months. But being able to be really specific about that is quite difficult at the moment when you don't quite know exactly what things are, you know, how negotiations will um, will develop or indeed what the protocol might look like. Absolutely. So we are doing it. Appreciate that you you won't have the details. Yeah. And over that, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Sinead Bradley. Just bring Sinead into the spotlight. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, Sinead. Thank you for your presentation so far. And just two points. I'm curious to know, in terms of resourcing within the department itself, I appreciate the three roles um, that you carry yourselves. And I'm just conscious with COVID obviously coming on us um, and the the amount of work that's happening um, in that regard across the department. Is there enough resource and manpower within the department to manage both COVID and the remaining time um, of the, you know, working through the protocol? And 
secondly, then the communications, you know, I'm reassured to hear that you feel heard and your uh, partners feel heard in terms of feeding in um, to the UK government and the negotiating team. But could you just describe that actual day to day workings to me more? Um, while I appreciate your feeding in, are you actually hearing back and are you hearing back regularly? And, you know, what, how, how up to date are, are the department kept in terms of the negotiations? Do we have enough uh, resource within DOJ? Uh, yes, absolutely. So we've had a dedicated uh, Brexit team uh, for for some time, headed by uh, Graham. The COVID team is a different; it has been a different team, and 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 some people, you know, there was one one individual within our Brexit team who who did volunteer for COVID work, but has has now come back. You know, if, if if I have any concerns around resourcing on Brexit, given the critical issues that are um, that are ahead of us, then those would be raised. I've got no doubt that this is treated as a priority within the department. So uh, no issues there. Um, on the second point about communication with UK government and what that might look like, so um, there are a range of, of, of things there. So there's formal mechanisms. So we have a range of sort of formal governance type boards um, that Home Office lead a uh, internal security delivery board is one of them, uh, which Graham uh, sits on. And that's a range of UK government partners and operational partners, as well as uh, DOG and our operational partners. And then there are things above that, which I sit on. Um, and we get, uh, we get a readout of um, where negotiations are going now. We're not involved in those. We, we feed in our views around what our priorities are. We do get some level of readout. You know, it's not hugely detailed, um, but it gives us a sense of where the direction of travel may be going. I, I, you know, we, we were definitely not privy to all the ins and outs of that, and nor would I expect us to be. Um, but I think, you know, in particular, having come from a different government, I think the, the relationship and information flow here is better than, than I know it is with other devolved administrations. Just, just to add to that, um, as Linda said, there's the Internal Security Delivery Board. Um, that meets on a fortnightly basis. Um, so DOJ is represented in that, as is PSNI, Public Prosecution Service, and so on. Um, on top of that, there are regular quadrilateral meetings with Home Office and then the three devolved administrations um, in which we, we can feed in uh, comments and views as well. And, and in both of those fora, we're, we're, we're getting readouts from, uh, from the negotiations. On top of that, there have been and continue to be a number of workshops led by Home Office, but again with uh, quite a wide cast list, both from a policy and operational perspective <coughs> from Northern Ireland. Um, and of course, we have direct access to the individual policy leads in Home Office on on the individual tools and measures. So there is there's regular and often in, engagement with, with Home Office, and it and it works both ways as well because they they will contact us if there are emerging issues or if there are particular um, you know particular issues that that we need to feed in. One tangible way of and, and it goes back maybe to the chair's first question as well about the reassurance that our, our issues are being heard. One tangible way that we feed into those, um, what I can think off the top of my head, is the provision of case studies um, by you know, PSNI and PPS around how individual measures are used perhaps slightly differently here or where they have a, a relative greater importance here. Um, and we can see that that then develops the thinking within, within Home Office. Scotland are doing the same. It's not unique to Northern Ireland. Um, but, but certainly the door has always been open and they've always been very, very, very willing to get, get that information. Things like case studies bring the, what could otherwise be a fairly dull discussion about some of the tools and measures actually bring it to life. That, that, that's been beneficial. Thank you. And are you regularly asked, because there is that unique set of circumstances here with having a land border, are you, you, are you regularly asked to engage from that perspective? as emerging issues come up? That would be our default position yeah. anyway. 
um, yeah. to, to make sure because the, the Justice Minister's priority is to ensure that the unique circumstances in Northern Ireland and sharing the land border um, are understood and are essentially at the heart of discussions um, because operational capability and, and the need to retain that operational capability in any scenario. So in a negotiated settlement where the UK government gets everything they want or a thinner negotiated settlement where they get some tools but not others, or in the worst case scenario, a non-negotiated outcome or effectively a no deal. Ultimately, our, what is of paramount importance to us is operational capability, particularly on a north-south basis. So that would be our default position to feed, feed those issues in. Um, but certainly we have never encountered any pushback or you know, any, any sense that, that that information is not useful. In fact, on the contrary, we have been told that it is, that it is useful in, in formulating wider, wider policy. Okay, because well, my fear is, Graham, and I'll, I'll just put it out there that while I appreciate your feeding in, and I get that, um, that if you really feel it's a conversation thing, it's two way and it's flowing, there's the likelihood then of an agreement being reached that when we instantly look at it, say, well, actually, that doesn't work here. There's no danger of that. Is that what you're telling me? No, I mean, to, to provide the committee with some reassurance, um, the UK legal text that was published recently, which effectively puts the, the, the bones around what was set out in their, their approach to negotiations, was shared. Um, and having shared that further with operational partners, they are content that the, the UK legal text and, and what that would deliver is, is fine, it's operable. If you know, similar uh, similar capabilities are provided as are set out in the in the UK legal text. That is a workable solution for Northern Ireland operational partners. But you know, I think there is the point there that we are not involved in the negotiations, and we don't you know we don't get real time read out of them or anything like that. So ultimately, you know, what is ultimately agreed between the UK and the EU, you know, we have no direct um, say in that. So we are doing our best in terms of how much influence we can deploy to try to make sure that it is designed rather, you know, that Northern Ireland's issues are designed into that as opposed to try to be retrofitted onto them afterwards when it's too late. And the point I probably should have made was in looking at the UK legal text, we can see that the issues that were of most importance to us are encompassed in, in, in the main measures that are under negotiation. So that also gives us a level of reassurance that we're, we're speaking, but we're also being heard as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Thank you, Any other members? Sorry, Mr. Beattie. Thank, thanks, Chair. Um, Graham, Linda, th thank you. Um, I'm interested in what Sinead just said about the, the inflow of information and the outflow of information to yourselves. And, and this committee's ability to scrutinise some of the high level things that they're planning to do because it really is sort of big hands small map here for us at this moment in time because I'm reading here about fast and effective exchange of criminal data, uh, exchange of DNA, transfer, reciprocal transfer of passengers, the Europol, Interjust, um, extradition. Um, but I've got a real fear that come November That'll still just be headlines. We won't know how that is going to affect us here in Northern Ireland. So the, the point is, with the outflow that's coming out to you, where are we, these headlines? Because they're just headlines here at the minute. I, I, I kind of want to know. Now, I, I think the last I heard, uh, Europol, the UK was probably running something like 65 to 70% of the Europol cases that were running at any one time. You know, that's what they were doing, and, and there's a real expertise within the data collection within the UK. So I want to know where we're going with this now. You know, now, I don't know if we can do it in open session or whether there's a briefing we can get in closed session, but I would really like to drill down to each one of these to see where they are and how they affect us. Is there any way we can get that? Do, do you mean in terms of where the UK government is in terms of its negotiations on this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I, I fully accept, Linda, that, that this is this is this is a UK negotiation. Yeah. Absolutely get that. I get that. But but this committee still has a, a scrutiny to understand how that affects us. So we need to distill down what each of these measures mean to us here 
in Northern Ireland. And if we don't get a, a degree of detailed readout of each of those high-level pieces, we can't do that. And, I, and I, I do have a fear that somebody's just going to plonk something on the table in November and we won't have scrutinised it unless we get a chance, even in closed session, to do that. So I think, you know, we would be more than more than able to go into detail on measures and what they mean and what the loss of them might be, what we definitely wouldn't be able to do because we just don't have that the access to exactly where the UK government is on those negotiations, how are they doing, have they talked about things in huge detail. I mean my sense from 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 what is in the press is that there is still a huge amount to negotiate. There's still a huge amount to discuss and you know even the framework around what uh, uh, an agreement in justice and security might look like. Will it be one, one justice and security arrangement or will it form part of something bigger or will there be individual agreements for a number of measures? Is, that's all still to play for. So my sense is that, you know, the UK government and the EU perhaps necessarily haven't got into that detail. I, I may be wrong, but that we certainly, you know, wouldn't be able to, to give you that level of. And, and, that, and that's what concerns me, I yeah. guess, because we're, this is July. Yeah. You know, this is July, yeah. and if we're not getting into that detail, so if I read this, for example, um, effective, effective exchange of DNA, just take that and fingerprints. Uh, you know, if, we, if I just take that for example, um, if the UK are discussing with the EU about biometrics, for example. If they're talking about the use of biometrics throughout the UK and EU, we need to know that because that would be a huge issue for us here in Northern Ireland, the use of biometrics um, in law enforcement here in Northern Ireland. That's, a, that's what I'm talking You see where I'm coming from Absolutely. here? Absolutely. It, it's, it's just trying to get a better understanding of what each of these actually mean. And, and, you, and I know you aren't getting all of the feed out. And I, I, sense, I sense that the inflow is there. I guess they are listening to you. But I'm not getting a sense yeah. that the outflow is at the detail we need. If it, if it reassures the committee, whilst it's, it's absolutely correct that we're not getting the detailed minutiae of, of the negotiations as a matter of international relations, it is clear from a negotiating perspective broadly what the UK is seeking uh, in relation to that package that you've referred to. So our starting point perhaps is that the UK, going, going back to the political declaration and so on, made quite clear that what it wanted was, as if, if it couldn't have, if it wasn't able to retain the EU measures, then it wanted as close to them as possible. Um, the EU's negotiating position was slightly different because they were coming at it from an institutional perspective where EU measures were essential to the EU and a third country outside them shouldn't have, have access to them. But at a very broad level, there's not a huge amount, although there's perhaps a disagreement around how they achieve it. There's not a huge amount of difference between what the UK and the EU want because the future security partnership is essential to both of them. And I wouldn't propose to run through. I mean, there's eight or, eight or nine big ticket issues that are being negotiated. But if it does give you some reassurance, Mr. Beatty, on, on ECRIS example, for example, where we say in our paper, fa the UK government is asking for fast and effective exchange of criminal records, what that means in real terms is that it wants the agreement to provide that similar capabilities as are currently provided by ECRIS, which is the European Criminal Records Information System, are retained. And the EU will say, well, you can't have ECRIS because you're not an EU member. There are certain, there are precedents for some measures for a third country to have, and this is, you know, kind of the, the middle ground. But certainly on ECRIS, the UK government would prefer to retain something that, you know, I can't believe it's not ECRIS is maybe the best way to put it. Um, on the exchange of DNA and biometrics, it wants the agreement to provide similar capabilities than the UK already enjoys in relation to what's called PROM. Um, so essentially it's, it's asking for as close to the status quo. Um, similarly, passenger name records, Europol, Europol, the UK is not seeking to remain <coughs> a member and have membership of Europol, but what it's asking for is what a third country would have, like the States or Japan, but with a bit more. So it's what they're referring to as, you know, third country plus. And that is to recognise particularly that the UK has a huge role in Europol and as a net contributor to investigations and so on. On the likes of Eurojust, um, they're asking for a third country arrangement. You know, so on extradition, for example, what they want is 
a fast warrant based surrender arrangement which will be as close to the European arrest warrant as possible. And the precedent out there is existing arrangements that the EU has with Iceland and Norway. So I, don't th I, I take your point entirely, um, but if it is some reassurance, they, they won't be asking for, in, in most cases, they won't be asking for much more than we currently enjoy because it's, it, is, it is back to maintaining operational capability. Fundamentally, the argument, I guess, is around that you know EU tools are for the EU, so it's finding that middle ground. Yeah. And, and I guess, and, and I am, you know, I, I, I do take comfort in that. Absolutely, take comfort in that. But and I, and I suppose it's trying to understand how these elements work as affects mm. Northern Ireland. Yeah. So when we talk about data sharing, okay, you can get an agreement of data sharing between the UK and the EU, but the EU can enlarge again. If they enlarge again and take in countries when we're data sharing with. And we don't want that data to go to those new countries that's coming in. I mean, are we looking? Is that being looked? Do you see where I'm coming from on that? So absolutely, and I think just just to finish off that that last point with a final bit of reassurance, um, you know, if there is a non-negotiated outcome, effectively a no deal, there are contingency plans that a lot of people have been working on for quite a long time. So if, in the worst case scenario, you end up with no deal whatsoever with the EU on some of these. So some of some of those kind of aspirational, you know, we hope to achieve this. If that isn't achieved at all, there are still fallbacks. Now they're suboptimal, but a lot of thinking has gone on across uh, the system here around what that might look like, so that people are ready to start on the first of January with some alternatives. With, with, with within within our justice department. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so so that, so there you go. So. That's the point I make. So those right. what ifs yes. that you're talking about, those yes. what ifs would be really useful as a yes. committee to see what the what ifs are. And again, I say this, uh, understanding that that might have to be in closed session, but it would be useful for us to understand yeah. what you are thinking with the what ifs. If this doesn't work. What if? What are we going to do? So actually, it's 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 detail on that contingency plan. Well, yeah, of that it. sort yes. of th the thinking of the Justice Department on on how it's going, and uh, you know, uh, maybe a, a sort yeah. of. You know, em, 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 empty your heads into a document or something, just so we can see what's going on. You don't want to see that. You don't want to see that. Mr. Reader. <laughs> again, I mean, the, the, the contingency arrangements, the fallback arrangements, if we lose a measure, will be across the UK. They, they will be the same across the UK. Um, and in terms of what instrument is used or how you go about, you know, what the extradition process is or how you share criminal records, um, because these are, these are tools that are sort of pan UK. Um, but there might be some really specific to us, Graham. Is the, the point that I'm making, even if we even if we look at the the, the, the outworkings of the Belfast Agreement and and how people view themselves, you know, being British, Irish, or both. I mean, just those specifics, and there, and there would be some. But listen, I've taken up for your time. Really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And your patience. No, no, thank you. And in terms of the the contingency type of measures, I think that would be helpful. But also, Graham, when you were responding, to Mr. Beatty there earlier, you had highlighted. Some of the, these areas, I think it's in your document on page 86, around part two of their approach around operational capabilities. There's a number of bullet points on that, um, yeah. which Brady had touched upon. I think it would be helpful if, if we could also have some more detail around what that could mean for, for Northern Ireland as well. So if, if we can have a look at the contingency, the what ifs, but also on that section, um, what, what that looks like in terms of implications. Northern Ireland compared to current position, and, and it may be chair that you know some of these things are best spoken about by operational partners as well. So you know, I'm sure if if, if you would value a, a multi-agency session at some point as well, I'm sure partners would be happy to do that too. Okay, well, there's no immediate panic, but it would be helpful, I think, for members a written briefing yeah. in the first instance. Linda, it's actually Gemma that's looking in oh. She, oh. for some reason. She's not. All right. Okay. Yeah, my dolo. Okay, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Linda, for passing on my message. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions, and I understand you might not have the answers to them right now, but just bear with me. Um, is the cost of exhibitions expected to rise um, after the 31st of December? The cost of extradition. Cost of extradition. Um, it would very much depend on on the outcome. Um, if if a negotiated settlement is achieved, then that would be what I referred to earlier, the, the Iceland-Norway type arrangements, which are as close to EAW as, as possible. Um, and the benefit to that is that the cases are much quicker. 
than they would be if we were relying on the worst case scenario, which would, in a, in a non-negotiated outcome, would be, believe it or not, the European uh, Convention of 1957. Um, so that gives you an idea of just how you know how old that is. Uh, cases are much more cumbersome. In, in those circumstances, cases would take longer, and one would expect that there would necessarily then be increased cost. Um, but in the event that the negotiated outcome is achieved, I, I couldn't say for certain. There may be slight differentials in how they would apply, but in principle, one wouldn't think that the cost of extradition would, uh, would necessarily increase. Obviously, every case is okay. different. Yeah, of course. Um if there is um, excessive delays, are there possible human rights issues linked with that? Under the the no deal arrangements or non negotiated arrangements? Yeah. yeah. Um, not not necessarily. Um, I mean, I think the there there are there are still uh, safeguards built in for an individual under the 1957 convention where their extradition is sought. Um, I would I would be racking my brains to do a, a compare and contrast. I have to say of of how how that would play out against the EAW, but even under the 1957 convention, that's a court a court based process. Um, so th th there are there are there are there is a rule for a court within it. Um, so there would still be checks and balances in terms of defendants' rights. Okay, thank you. And my last question is. Um, there's random passport checks going on, as we know, on public transport between north and south. And um, would that be expected to intensify um, or stop, or what would the impact on that in a no deal or a deal scenario? I didn't hear that. Sorry. Sorry. Um, the random, you know, the random passport checks that are taking place on public transport between the north and the south. Um, what would the impact be on them if in an, a deal or no deal scenario? Or would you know? Um, I, I, I wouldn't. Passport uh, checks, north south of it? Mm. Yeah. Passport checks. So uh, it happens at the minute. Currently, random passport checks that yeah. take place on the north south. That's an issue that has been considered. Or well, obviously, the, the, the wider common travel area yeah. uh, would, would, still, would still exist. Yeah. Um, I, I can't. I mean, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that issue, and I can't speak for for Border Force because obviously the processes that they're that if, if those are in place is, is a matter matter for them. Um, but but certainly from a from a wider common travel area perspective, for for citizens citizens of Ireland, I don't think that would be a that would be an issue. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. That's my questions. Okay, thank you, Gemma. Can I just ask yes, on the back of something that Gemma asked us on the on the human rights stuff? Obviously, the the British government have have indicated a reluctance to adhere to the ECHR. What impact would that have if there's divergence in the future on any justice deal, or do you have any ideas of of the type of impact that might have? So I think that's one of the kind of hot issues in terms of that, that sort of creep through the whole negotiations and what agreement may be received, a bit like um, what court has got jurisdiction over any disputes in the future. Now, you know, we can see that the EU are quite keen to have some sort of mechanism in any agreement that allows them to have some sort of oversight on rights issues. And the UK government have said absolutely not, that's not your place. So I think that still has got some way, some journey to go to play out in terms of what, how that may or may not impact any agreement. So I don't have an immediate answer to that at the moment because that is, that is bleeding through um, a, a lot of the negotiations. I'm not quite sure when we may see a movement on that, but somebody will need to move on that issue. It is, I mean, it is one of the horizontal issues yeah. in terms of the negotiations, along with the role of the uh, Court of Justice of the EU and around data sharing and so on. Um, I think there is still, as mm. Linda said, still some way to go uh, in, in squaring that circle. Would, would we have a similar type thing as to what you know Doug and, and Paul have talked about, where you could have, well. If the British, if there's no deal in the British government, there's no agreement in this. The British government move away from ECHR, which I imagine they will. If there's no deal, 
then have we an idea of the impact then that that it would have on justice? There won't be a justice deal, but then the impact it would have on justice in general. So I think, I mean, obviously ECHR is independent of membership of the EU. It's, it's, a, it's a separate it's a separate thing, although has been has been brought into focus as a result of the negotiations. And I think, you know, inevitably when you have. ECHR embedded into, you know, for, for a number of years embedded into a justice system and, and, and case law um, developed by courts, you know, there, there would be an implication much wider than obviously a, a Brexit one, much wider than an EU exit one. Um, so, you know, I, I would see the the, the deal and the discuss and the negotiations is something separate because you know being in or out of ECHR is not on the table as such and as part of the negotiations it's just a mechanism that the EU want to include to make sure that any deal is sustainable from their rights perspective in the future. And I guess as well, although the UK government has not yet and or hasn't given a commitment mm. in relation to ECHR. What they have said in their approach to negotiations is that they retain a commitment mm -hmm. to human rights. Mm -hmm. And if it's not ECHR, it could potentially be through Council of Europe human rights provisions. So again, we have to we have to see how that, that plays out. But I think that that is a fundamental negotiating issue between mm -hmm. between UK and EU. Um, I think obviously the UK will want to be human rights compliant. Whether it's done through ECHR or done through an alternative mechanism is, I guess, all to play for. Okay. Sinead Bradley again. We're just going to bring Sinead into the spotlight. Um, thank you, thank you Sinead. We can hear you. So it's just come um, to my mind. I'm, I'm just conscious that talking about the talks will be ramping up now during July and August, and I'm conscious that the committee may not have many opportunities to meet during that. And if there could be an established um, data information share that happens during that time of emerging issues come up so that we have as close of access to live feed um, so nothing comes at us unexpectedly, it would be helpful, Chair. It would be worth considering. Okay. Is there any other questions to... Can I thank Linda and Graham and Billy, your, your <laughs> colleagues of <have> held the <laughs> fort. They've held the fort very well for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but thank you all very much for, for coming thank to you. the night today. And thank if you, you do want us to come back, you know, in September or something, I don't know when you're... A recess is over, but when things are maybe a bit fuller, we know a Problem. bit more, we're happy to do that, obviously. Can we wish the committee a very pleasant yep. summer break? Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, well, Thanks, we'll, we'll Thank you. request specifically the information that members have, have highlighted there, and when we get information on that and Thank you. Thank you. we'll include the as as things emerge you know, we want to be kept informed and obviously um, committee members can we can get information circulated if that becomes re a requirement um, so the, the next meeting isn't is scheduled for the 3rd of September that's probably earlier than when the assembly obviously it's going to continue sitting in July but whenever in terms of plenary sessions. Um, we don't have a date yet, I think, for when it will break and when it comes back, but we have our course of work to do on the domestic abuse by the 15th of October is the date from the Assembly for us to complete. So the meeting on the 3rd is to get into the deliberation consideration stage You know, in terms of what goes into the... When we get the, the draft report, we need as a committee to start teasing all of that out. So there will be an informal meeting to start all of that process. Is there anything, Christine, you need to advise around that process as we get into September from your previous experience? Um, no, I think what we'll be planning for the 3rd of September is um, a full committee meeting. Um, I think the committee's already agreed to get a briefing by the bill clerk who's working on the domestic abuse bill. Um, it's always useful before we start the deliberations to have um, a briefing with the bill clerk 
to explore maybe some of the issues that will be done in private session um, so that we can explore some things with Bill Clark and she can provide advice or take them away to think about them. Um, and then we're hoping by that stage we'll have the written departmental response on all the issues. So we'll be asking for that over the summer so that we know the department's response to the issues that have been raised and their position on them. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll look at how we can break it down into sections so that the committee can start discussing. Um, the process really is to have informal deliberations, first of all, on the issues to tease out where members may be as a committee want to move on something or are content just to reference it in the report or whatever. Um, and we'll start working through the bill in section and try and narrow down the issues. Um, if there is amendments that the committee does wish to pursue, then generally we discuss with the department first um, and depending on its position, then we do have access to drafting. We can draft amendments for the committee and um, to agree as committee amendments. So there's a process, but generally what we'll do is go through it informally, first of all, um, so that we everybody's clear what sort of position you want to reach. Um, and once we've gone through it all informally, hopefully towards maybe the third week in September, we'll be in a position at least to put most of the formal questions on the, on the clauses. Um, uh, and then all of that's reflected in the draft report, which has to be signed off by the committee for the 15th of October. So we've got a quite a tight time scale because there are quite a number of issues that have come up um, and we're looking for more information on a lot of those. So what we're planning to do is have all of that ready for coming back at the beginning of September so that you have what you need to have those discussions. Um, thank you very much for that. Not to burden anybody's workload uh, and certainly not over the summer period. Um, but I think, again, I, I'm struggling here to keep up with the movements in Westminster in that, on that bill. Now, I know it's not the same bill, but I do think it will, could be a worthy exercise that we have at least that bill in one screen of thought as we're pursuing through the clauses that's in the Northern Ireland-based bill. Because it strikes me if there's something that's of very good value and good use and, and, and good ideas within that coming through, and I know there was an amendment Lately there, even this week, uh, and it may well be that we could, if in agreement, even in, as a committee or as individuals, it, it, you know, it may be that we will be able to use the wording of a, of a clause on that, on that bill to place onto the Northern Ireland based bill, and it might help the committee and the bill clerk. In that regard, now it might not, it might need tweak to make it Northern Ireland centric. Of course, of course, that may be the case. But I would hate for this bill to go through here in Northern Ireland, and we've missed a trick. Uh, and that might be just one way of safeguarding it, us, and making sure that we've got a panoramic view of everything that's contained within domestic violence and what should or should not be included in the bill here. So I think that. Whilst I'm trying to keep an eye on Westminster with regards to the passage of their bill, I think it would be useful to get a, a committee collegiate view on that, uh, or sight on it at the very least, maybe not a view, but a sight, uh, and that way then, if there's something that we are teetering on the brink of doing something on, that may well help our assessment on it. I'll leave it If there. members find it helpful, what we can do is we'll do a, a paper that first of all, highlights what's in the Westminster Bill that's not in our bill already from where it started. And then we'll look to see what information there is on any amendments or, or additions they seem to be taking forward. Um, it's probably easier to do it if they go into recess yes. because then it stops and we can do it. Yes. It's a piece of work at the minute it is because we have been keeping an eye on it and it is um, changing. But um, I'm assuming they will go into recess probably sometime at the end of July or whatever and probably at that stage it's it's fairly easy then just to put it all together so we can do a paper for you coming back in September that at least highlights what's already in it that's not covered by our bill and then what <coughs> amendments of any they, they appear to be or they've already agreed to to move on areas because there, there, are, there are things coming through on it. And new we've, fresh we've things. Seen, yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's that one. Parental alienation. 
that side off and I've already shared it with Christine. Um, no, that's fine. Um, we, we can do that. So unless there's something absolutely urgent that necessitates a meeting, it'll be 3rd of September. Um, we've informal meetings. I have one tomorrow on the witnesses that have been arranged. So Cathy has contacted the members of that group and there's two individuals that will be taking evidence from in that informal setting tomorrow afternoon. Um, and there's a course of work to be done in terms of that process, so members will be kept informed around that. Is there any other business? If not, then we shall adjourn. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.